the, the topic today is cyber and cyber liability insurance. And this is absolutely one of the more challenging issues that many companies face. I mean, we face a very expansive uh, dynamic and marketplace with respect to ransomware. There's a number of, of dynamics that are occurring with respect to the market. And we're really thrilled. We've got a, a diverse um, set of industry leaders, practitioners that have been in this space. And, and what I'd love for them to do uh, before I hand it off to, to my friend and colleague, Dave, to, to queue up Gabe on this, is we'll just have each of the uh, panelists go through and do a quick introduction starting with uh, Phil. Phil, if you wouldn't mind a little bit about your background and your company, and then we'll hand that off to Joe, to Wayne, and then Gabe, and I'll have Dave um, do the introduction, if that's all right, Dave, of, of Gabe and what we'll end up sharing. Great. Well, thanks, Matt, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Phil Dukoff. I've been in the insurance industry for 20 years. Uh, prior to this, I was with one of the big five, now final four accounting firms. I tell people I made the jump from at test, or from assurance to insurance. I'm still doing insurance. And before that, I spent 15 years with one of the, uh, the nation's largest payroll processors. So my experience with cyber and data security started with the big irons and the system 38s, 34s, 32s, AS 400s which is dinosaur era to most of the people on this call, I'm afraid, uh, and, and managed to weave a career together into actually supporting data privacy. They had no idea back in the day that cyber was going to have the impact that it has had and is having on the industry today. Uh, San Diego came here in 1994 for what we thought was a two-year assignment. That didn't work out very well. So we're, we're enjoying San Diego, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Matt for quite a long time, and Matt, I'd follow you as a chapter president anywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Joe. So, so the last thing I wanted to add, I'm sorry for, for taking so long. So um, USI is four years new to San Diego. We were uh, originally Wells Fargo Insurance. We were acquired by USI four years ago this December. So between banking and accounting and payroll processing, I feel that uh, we're very well positioned to be on the panel today. So thank you for including me. Fantastic, thrilled to have you here. Joe, if you could, similar uh, question, kind of a little bit about your background and, and your organization. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, Phil. Um, it's, good, it's good we have a, a really wide range of panelists here. I appreciate everybody coming too. Um, it's, it's great to see uh, 25 plus uh, attendees here interested in cyber insurance. Uh, usually people aren't uh, super interested in this subject um, on the insurance side, but uh, I, I tend to uh, get questions when it's required, but I, it's good to see people actively seeking out this information. So um, I'm definitely appreciative of that. Um, I've been doing insurance for 12, 12 years. Um, I've been kind of a generalist working with all different types of companies, and I've definitely seen the onset of cyber uh, come up in the last couple of years. I mean, we kind of, uh, we saw we saw a lot of uh, breaches this year, uh, it's kind of bloomed, uh, if you will, uh, as far as the risk goes. So it's definitely top of everyone's mind. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's me, Joe. I'm here in San Diego. Um, our office is C3. Uh, so you see it behind me. Uh, we love to work with uh, all all types of businesses. So um, happy to be on this panel. Thanks. Excellent, Wayne. Welcome. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I also work uh, in the office with Joe C three Risk Insurance Services. Uh, uh, I'm throughout California and uh, internationally. Just having returned from a 12 year stint in Hong Kong uh, as an expat. Uh, and uh, we focus, uh, my primary focus is on the life science, uh, med tech uh, and, and technology side of insuring companies for, for their risks uh, in cyber and uh, in clinical trials. So that's why this, this is a pretty timely uh, topic for a lot of our clients, especially with uh, digital health. So um, it's good to be part of it, thanks. 
Excellent. And looking forward to learning more about that particular sector. Dave, if I could, I'll have you introduce Gabe and we'll kind of queue up the, uh, uh, the quick demonstration and then we'll jump into the panel topic. So Dave Tuckman from our board. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I'll give Gabe a moment to introduce himself, but he is with uh, Cowbell Cyber and uh, he's going to be walking us through uh, from the underwriting perspective uh, what happens when someone is looking to uh, uh, apply for it, uh, what's being asked and the information along those lines. Um, Gabe, you are, it looks like you are muted. So if you want to take that off and uh, just share with everybody for a moment who you are. You oh, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. So I wasn't able to figure out uh, this right click wasn't working if I needed to hand over controls or not. So I apologize about that uh, as well. That um, would be nice to you for the duration. <laughs> <laughs> I was going screwed up. <laughs> um, but hi, everybody. My name is Gabe Carone, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. So I'm with Cowbell Cyber. I'm the territory sales manager uh, with Cowbell. I've been in the industry for about 17 years, uh, came on as a producing side, um, direct on the direct side and the captive, captive world and also on the independent side. So kind of seeing the different uh, plethora of, of how to how to write insurance, but I can tell you that cyber is just one of those um, verticals that has changed um, a lot. And I think a lot of it has changed, especially through COVID. Um, I think you can see all those national headlines uh, popping out um, almost daily, it seems like, uh, talking about it. But today I'll be talking more about the underwriting process, kind of what that looks like, and then uh, showing everyone our, our uh, Cowbell Cyber platform. So to give everyone a, an overview of uh, who Cowbell is, uh, we are in SureTech. Uh, so we are a two-year-old company and uh, growing uh, very quickly, and we're all across all 50 states. And um, I actually work with C3. So uh, Joe and Wayne, thank you both for uh, making an introduction to uh, to Isaac, I'm very excited about it. So, um, Bill, nice to meet you as well. Looking forward to today. Excellent. Why don't we go ahead and walk through some of the questions, if you will, that occurs when an organization is in the process of, of uh, looking for cyber liability insurance, and then to kind of frame the panelists and get them queued up for that after this quick kind of demo. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of the market and, and how it's changed, notably in the last probably 18 months from, from to a relatively tight market. So, hey, Gabe, uh, if you, sorry, I was going to say, if you can bring up your screen real quick, we can. I mean, if you guys can see it, just give me a thumbs up or knowledge. It's rendered. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good. Great. Cool. Um, well, I'll go ahead and begin. So this is a Cowbell cyber platform, right? So it's proprietary, not, not, not every, obviously, insurance carrier system is going to look the same. So I want to run through you what a practice uh, demonstration. And so this is like a, a this is actual, um, you know, practice site, if you will. So I'm not going to hurt anything, not going to not going to damage anything. So just want you guys to know that in case we wanted to play around it. But I'm going to run through this uh, example. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, Valley, uh, Vaca Valley roofing as an example. So I want to run through again just what the typical underwriting questions uh, would be like. So I've already preloaded some of the information just to, for simplicity's sake. Um, I'm saying uh, we're, we're, we're pulling basic information, right? But in terms of like the actual rating um, itself for cyber risk, we're looking at the overall revenue. Uh, so I'm saying in this case, the uh, account has 120 million in revenue. Uh, we do use the NAX code, uh, right? So uh, just pulling that, that's a roofing contractor. Um, we do ask for the employee count and then the year established, right? So um, again, we do need these, but at least for the purpose of quoting, it's not uh, uh, just not required. Just we need to firm it up once we're ready to bind coverage. I'm going to scroll down here if you guys if you guys are okay at this point. <laughs> um, <laughs> give me one sec. All right. Scrolling down the contact. We don't need this for the purpose of quoting, but again, it's just something that's asked about, right? So I just want to mention this because a lot of times we get questions like, who should we put in there? So if there's been a claim in this situation, um, that's where they'll, they'll need that contact information. And then here are the questions uh, that we want to talk about for underwriting. So have there been any past cyber incidents. I do want to point out, it says incidents, not claims, right? So even if they haven't had cyber insurance in the past, but they have had an incident, you would want to indicate this as a yes. 
quick, a quick question. I know we're in the spirit of just doing a high level demo more on kind of what this initial process looks like, but how does the industry define a cyber incident? Semantics tends to be fairly important in this space. So every company is having a cyber incident in one form or another. It could be a, a phishing email that got through or, or even uh, a port scan that was blocked at a firewall. Those can conceivably be classified as cyber incidents or not, depending on how the definition is set up. Matt, that's a great question. And every carrier is going to look at that differently with their own definition, right? So every, everyone's going to be a little bit different. So for us, uh, if there's been like a formal complaint uh, where you're getting the, um, uh, some kind of investigation involved, we're getting uh, police authorities involved, we're looking at a, at a formal incident where something, where action has been taken. Okay. But to your point, every carrier is going to look at that a little bit differently. Um, just going down the questions here again, that contact, which I just mentioned a second, uh, second ago, and then training. Uh, so we know a lot of times training isn't done today, but would they be willing to implement it? Uh, so we do offer free training with Wiser uh, to implement training. Just wanted to, wanted to call it out because I know a lot, a lot of times organizations don't have um, training that's required. Now so these are the, so, sorry. Yeah. So on the insurance side, uh, through Calbell, uh, training is not required presently. Yeah. So to, to not require if they don't have it today, that's fine. But going forward to to bind coverage as as one of the uh, subjectivities, then that would be a requirement going forward. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So here are the. Uh, Here's where more of the detailed questions start to come in. So does the organization encrypt emails, mobile and computing devices containing sensitive information, including PII, uh, I think everyone knows the personal identifiable information sent to, uh, sent to external parties. So um, I'm gonna pause here because we've definitely been getting a lot of questions overall from small business owners about, about this and why, and why it's important. So, um, you know, again, it's not a requirement per se, but today in, to, in today's uh, state, it is very difficult to get cyber uh, insurance if they don't encrypt today. Mm -hmm. The next question regarding do they store information on the cloud? Um, so, you know, good or bad, it doesn't matter, but uh, just knowing, knowing the fact that if, you, if the organization does store information on the cloud, uh, it'll it'll rate accordingly, so there will be a premium added to that. So so let's uh, and and again, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate, and then if we ever meet in person, club me upside the head. Uh, <laughs> one could argue that storing information in the cloud is far more secure than storing information on your own premises, depending on the tool that's being used and how it's being used. So when we see some of the underwriting questions, or at least the preliminary filtering questions. Um, how do these organizations look at this? Because it, you know, do you encrypt yes or no? Most organizations probably have some form of encryption, even if it's not necessarily known to them in terms of the tools that are being used. So would, as we, as we get into our discussion a little bit more from a panel perspective, we'll want to hit on topics like this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think those questions kind of following that will, uh, we'll button those, we'll button that answer up, right? Uh, in terms of what, um, in terms of what they're doing to, to update that or what their plans are in place. So, uh, sometimes, sometimes we see Matt, nothing in place. Like yeah. we don't see any backups. We don't see any, any plan in place whatsoever, like, like nothing. And so that's where there's an, that's where there's a real issue involved. So, so to this point, right. So, so, so obviously the more, uh, the more updates, the more often, uh, the better this looks. So weekly or more, it's definitely more ideal, but uh, we realize that is not uh, not always the case. And so uh, that's that's where those different options involve. So uh, same thing with the backups in place there too. And then how how they're how they're doing backups if they're encrypted, if they're tested, if they're online or tested. So uh, the more the better in that case. And then here, uh, do you enforce multi-factor authentication? So, um, you know, I think this is probably a good good topic to, to kind of pause here. So we see a lot of organizations today that do not enforce this whatsoever, or really um, are not aware of what it is. 
um, and really don't understand the importance um, of it today. So um, I, I think having this discussion and understanding why it's important, what is multi-factor authentication? Well, I think most of you in this, um, I think everyone on this panel understands that, but I think educating uh, those small business owners today and, the, and realizing what the importance is and how to do it, um, and realizing it's, it's really not that difficult to do so, it's just more about the why and the how. And then here with an incident response plan, um, you know, a, a lot of times we still see, uh, for the most part, small business owners don't really have a plan in place. Um, so if they don't have a plan, uh, we provide a plan, or at least a, a template for that one that they could use uh, so that they would be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to get a cyber insurance uh, put forth. Because that, that would be a subjectivity going forward to bind if they have nothing in place today. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to answer these questions here just to make it easier <laughs> when we go through. Okay. I'm gonna hit save and then I'm gonna scroll down here. And the next question uh, in regards to contingent system failure. Um, are internet uh, accessible systems segregated from organiza organizations uh, trusted network? network. So um, an example of this, if, if, uh, you know, if you're an agency and uh, insurance agency and you use a, a AMS system or agency management system, is that how is that system tied to a, to a server? Is it, uh, is it separated? Um, what does that look like? And then are there any third party agreements with that server? So cybercrime, all these questions would have to be marked yes in order to have uh, to have cybercrime. So does the organization vendor su uh, supplier, um, uh, excuse me, does the organization verify bank accounts before adding to their accounts payable systems? And, the, and this is where you're worried about things like wire transfer fraud, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is so common and so easy to do, um, believe yeah. it or not, so absolutely. Does the organization authenticate uh, funds transfer request by calling and just making sure it's a it's a number that they uh, that they're aware of that they know, and do they prevent unauthorized employees from making those wire transfers? So yeah, believe it or not, this uh, for cyber crime, you know, it seems like it's a pretty easy thing to to prevent, but this is where a lot of that cyber crime uh, comes from. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um... You know, if you're calling, um, make sure you're not calling the the number on that email that got sent to you. Look up the email. Look up the number separately because they these uh, cyber criminals are are pretty sophisticated, and they'll even have call centers to take your call. So just wanted to add that in there. Exactly. Yeah. This is good. Well, and and I know obviously when when someone is attesting to this, there are. Uh... <laughs> civil and criminal penalties for making false statements to insurance uh, carriers uh, clearly is kind of part of the underwriting process. So it's, it's critical that organizations actually understand this uh, fact pattern and what's there. Um, I know we'll, we'll, we'll jump back into kind of the panel discussion here in just a moment, unless there's a couple other items that you uh, gave that you want to highlight. Uh -huh. You know, again, I think we talked about the full system failure already um, and kind of what the importance of that was. So I'm just going to hit mark yes, and then I'm going to hit save from here. Yeah, it gave one question. Is there any of those questions, if it's answered a certain way, is just a deal killer right out of the gate? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for cyber crime, if you want any of that cyber crime, if you mark no, I mean, that's, that's going to kill it right there. A lot of times, you know, in terms of cyber, you're going to want that coverage, so that has to be done. Um, sure. With the MFA... With the MFA going back to MFA, you know that's going to be at the underwriter's discretion in terms of what controls they have in place today. Um, so if they have nothing in place and they want MFA, and depending on the size of the business, uh, that could be very much a requirement um, that they would have to get it to get cyber. So again, it's you know I hate to be gray there, Dave, but it's really going to be at the, at the size of the no. business and kind of what the direction of what of how they're growing um, as a whole. No, so, I, I understood, and I could see the rules changing on Monday with the way things are. You know. yep. Gabe, if I can ask yeah, you a I question, couldn't... Gabe, from an underwriting standpoint, is Calval the kind of carrier that is a one and done? If you fail the scan once, are you done or do you offer a cure period 
to the applicant to potentially allow them to fix whatever the, the issues are and then reapply? Yeah, that's a really good question, Phil. So, um, um, so we have a, what's called a continuous underwriting process. So we constantly are, are scanning and evaluating that risk. Uh, so once they do the client, like, you know, and, and, and um, which I'll show you here in a second that we constantly scan that risk. But let's say to your point, they do get declined. They don't have any controls in place. Uh, will they be able to get cyber insurance uh, with us going forward? So yes, they would. We obviously reevaluate it. If there have been prior uh, incidents, let's say uh, in the past year, that would make it um, more prohibitive where they'd have to maybe wait a little bit longer to get cyber insurance. But, you know, uh, going forward, once they put a plan in place, uh, part really, um, I think one of the one of the biggest solutions is really partnering, uh, partnering with a firm um, that can take care of cybersecurity. Uh, there's still a wide gap there. Uh, we like to have that partnership working with a cyber, uh, some cybersecurity firm of their choice, of course, but working with somebody because it's all about risk management. It's about working with uh, obviously the, the insurance agent, um, uh, the partner uh, from from their IT side, um, them of course, and then us. Um, it's not just one party can do it all. It's 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 a really a team. Of getting this done. Excellent. Why don't we, uh, in, unless there's any other items, but I, I kind of get the the tone of this. Why don't we go ahead and we'll we'll jump into the the panel discussion. And what I would love to do is is maybe Phil at a high level, and then we'll hit Joe and and Wayne, and then come back to you, Gabe, as well. Phil, just from, from your perspective, I mean, we're seeing a lot of dynamics in this marketplace right now. And I've heard anecdotally through CISO roundtables and elsewhere, um, you know, direct uh, firsthand experience that the market has changed a lot. Maybe a, a high level overview of how you see the market right now and what's driving some of that change. Sure. Um, from my experience, cyber is today where DNO insurance was a couple of days after Enron hit, <laughs> where the, the, the day before Enron, we would read business plans and the last page was dedicated to governance. And basically it said, we have some. And then Enron hit and suddenly the last eight pages, 10 pages, 17 pages of the business plan was dedicated to governance. And which put a lot of, of pressure, Sarbanes-Oxley on internal controls as we all know. Cyber is now experiencing that. And most of it's being driven by ransomware. Carriers are basically at a point where they're done paying out full limit losses because the bad guys are getting into the system. The first thing they look for is the folder marked insurance and they go and they're smart enough to read to see what the limits are. And coincidentally, that's what the ransom demand starts at. <laughs> and so CEOs are known to be impatient. And if the ask is 5 million for 5 million of limits, the attitude is pay it. Carriers now are saying we're tired of collecting $35,000, $40,000 and paying out millions in full limit losses. So they're dragging in a concept called co-insurance, which is if you want to pay the two and a half, the $5 million, two and a half of it is yours. Because what they're really trying to do is steer people into good backups, rigid routines, making sure that they've got not just backups, but air-gapped backups that are now away from the blast zone. So in case the main enterprise melts down, they can be back up and running in a very short period of time. And the carriers, because of the co-insurance, they're, they're doing their best to incentivize clients, companies, to pay attention to what their IT folks have been screaming for forever, which is give me enough budget to go out and get what I need. And, and I think back to one of the earlier questions, um, my humble belief is that the cloud makes the internet more fragile. And because if I can break into a cloud routine, and we've seen this with MSSPs and we've seen it with MSPs, those are choke points. So as we move from EDR to XDR requirements, we're starting to incorporate what are the, the internal controls for cloud environments. So maybe that's past my 30 seconds of allotted time, but that the market is such now that all of a sudden everybody wants it. We've got high, high demand. We've got uh, a, a waning supply. As a matter of fact, going into the fourth quarter, there's some carriers that have not re been able to renew their reinsurance yet. Wow. So there are carriers that are out there saying, look, I want your business, but I don't have someone to lay the second two and a half million dollars off on 
through reinsurance. So we're, we're going to see more and more pressure on pricing. So the, the moral of the story is, as much as we like to pound our chests and say we understand insurance, what you know may not be as important as who you know, because there's a thousand solutions out there. Making sure that you've got a Rolodex that, or at least you know somebody with a Rolodex that can help you not only get smarter on the front end and look prettier on the front end, but then maybe get the pin back into the hand grenade on the back end should you find yourself jammed up with a ransom attack. And having had a client go through it, I, I can wax eloquently on that for another half an hour, but I'll, I'll defer back to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Exactly. Joe, kind of similar question to you, sir. What, what is your take on the market right now? What are some of the dynamics that you're seeing? Yeah, I would echo what Bill was saying. Uh, the market is getting what we call really tight. And um, pricing is, you know, pricing went up in 2020, 20% pretty much across the board. I think it's hitting another 20%. Uh, like you said about co-insurance um, deductibles um, are going up or self-insured retentions. Uh, it's, that's just another way of saying what you pay before um, the insurance company kicks in has gone up. Um, uh, going on, what was Gabe was talking about, uh, the underwriting requirements are getting much higher. I mean, if you put that you don't have backups, um, you know, in an application and a company declines you, they're not going to come look at you again. Um, the companies are just getting really strict. So it's important that you're your agent or whoever you're talking to um, kind of creates a story of uh, safety and um, good, good risk management um, on the front end uh, because the carriers are definitely getting more picky on who they take. And that's not just because the higher risk of um, cyber claims and ransomware, it's also because uh, these carriers are, are at capacity or almost at capacity where they, they can uh, like what Phil, Phil was saying, they can't even take any more clients, um, you know, until, you know, some come off the back or, um, you know, they can get reinsured for higher limits um, or they can, you know, increase their reserves. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a changing market. There are still carriers um, like Cowbell that um, make business relatively easy to do, but um, carriers are being more discerning. And um, if you don't have multi-factor authentication or um, if you don't have something simple like a firewall or a virus scan, you just forget about it. You're not going to be able to get insurance. And they do like to see that um, you're working with uh, managed service providers and that you are, you know, backing things up daily, if not at real time. So um, yeah, I would say, you know, we're all kind of coming out ahead with a, uh, MSPs and uh, insurance carriers and agents all working together to get people insured. And you can still get some good um, good insurance terms out there. It's just, uh, like Phil was saying, uh, a lot harder and uh, the prices have gone up. Yeah. Wayne, I'd love to, to get your perspective. And I know that you've got a background in, oops, I apologize. Perfect timing, I apologize. Wayne, you've got a background in kind of healthcare and biotech, and, and that's obviously an industry, at least for us here in San Diego, uh, that's especially important. Maybe walk through some of the dynamics you see there. Yeah, um, it, it's always interesting when we start to see, uh, we, we will typically get a call from one of the law firms, one of the accounting firms saying, I have a client and they need, it used to start with only, they just raised this much money, the board needs director's officer's liability. And we immediately start there. Um, but there's, they're coming in at all different stages. So it could be clinical trials. So those are typically small policies, but now cyber was always an afterthought or I didn't really need that. Now it's, it's part of every package. There are some, some things like wearable devices. Uh, wearable devices are, 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 could be fraught with, uh, Get the ability to get hacked and all that personal information uh, is gone. And even this is where uh, cyber criminals look for uh, 
healthcare companies because they can sell that information, that personal medical information on the dark web for 10 to 20 times more than a, than a social security number or a credit card. So um, this is why it's incumbent. And when we, when we work with um, emerging companies, they're scrambling to put everything in place, boards, uh, mm -hmm. HR, <laughs> everything. And, you know, we do a lot of handholding and even with things that aren't uh, involved in insurance, just because we know a lot of, we have a lot of different clients in a lot of different fields. So um, I'm not sure I entirely answered the question, but, but yeah, life science, tech. Um, I just had a call this morning that uh, someone needed cyber insurance. They sell NFTs um, in different countries and they're a gallery. Uh, they're basically an insurance, they're, they're uh, sorry, uh, uh, an art gallery. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and they're trying to, so, so anyway, uh, we'll, look at, uh, we'll look at Cowbell for that. <laughs> exactly. Gabe, how about from your perspective, what are you seeing in the market right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I would just, I would echo everyone's comments. It's just, you know, if you look at the last five years, you know, five years ago, there were, there were stats saying that overall 24 million, there's an uh, overall incurred cost globally were 24 million in cyber attacks. And a year later, 209 million. Last year, uh, it was recorded 170 billion in overall cyber attacks. So uh, you put that in insurance terms, well, who's, who's paying for that, right? Um, it's it's going to go, uh, it's going to be a shared cost, obviously. So um, the industry is just getting, unfortunately, uh, bigger when it comes to cyber threats. There, there was a, uh, a, a good question that Neil Packard, who's also a member of our board, had posited around um, how you start looking at third parties. Specifically, he says, quote, given the number of breaches resulting from external parties, what degree of due diligence are carriers requiring, looking for with regard to third parties? And, and I'll unpack that for just a moment. So you've got Entity A, which is the company that wants to get the cyber liability insurance. You're looking at them from a risk perspective. Are you also digging into who some of their material vendors and suppliers are as part of that evaluation and underwriting process? Mm -hmm. uh, that for me, Matt? That, that all, we'll hit, we'll stripe that across the panel. So yeah. you, we'll go Gabe, then we'll jump over Phil to you, sir, and then uh, Joe and yeah. Well, you know, I just showed the, the screen there a second ago with the questions, right? And so all, all it really was asking if there's if there was some kind of contracts in place to, to mitigate any kind of really social engineering or reverse social engineering. So uh, they wanted to see some kind of contractually uh, what was there, but um, we're not going through and asking for each vendor requirement, what those contracts are. The carrier, us, like we're not reviewing those particular contracts. So Yes, we do ask for some kind of, uh, obviously you saw verifying those accounts, how those uh, tr funds transfer are done, if they're calling and, and making those um, accordingly, but um, we're not going through and verifying each one individually. So um, at high level, I would say it's being underwritten, but on, on a granular level per contract at this point, it, it's not being heavily underwritten. Gotcha. Phil, how about from your perspective, sir? Well, the first thing that came to my mind was Target and the way that they were breached, which was through their HVAC vendor. So it is, uh, I, I'm gonna find on what Gabe said. I think it's, it's a real issue. I don't think people are thinking about it. We're, we're just trying to crest the hill of, we're too small, they'll never bother us. <laughs> but if you're, if you're working in the, the aerospace and defense industry, that is the number one choke point. People are going after the small third-party vendors as a way to ride the protected carrier wave into the mother ship. Um, I, I think we're at a point in, in my practice of education. It's, it's something you wanna make people aware of because when you get that blinding flash of the obvious, when you bring this up and you get the blank stare of, ooh, we never thought about that. Uh, that's the first step of the 10 step process of, of figuring this all out. It's necessary. We're finding that our clients are being asked through contractual requirements to disclose what they have in place. We're trying to get our clients to do the same to their vendors and partners. Exactly, exactly. Joe, how about on your end? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that uh, there is some, um, uh, scans of people's 
uh, people's uh, infrastructure uh, to make sure that our remote access points are are closed or uh, and everything. But they're not looking at the individual uh, vendors unless you're if you're storing your your data on the cloud. Um, they usually ask what what company are you using. Um, so uh, they they will look at that. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that they're discerning too too much. I know that some of the smaller companies, um, you know, they do a, they do a pretty good job of, of storing data and everything. I mean, that's kind of usually if it's a good company, you know, they know that storing data is kind of their bread and butter. So they're going to do everything they can to to um, keep it from being infiltrated. But I mean, as you've seen, uh, that can definitely change. I mean, you guys saw what happened with Kaseya and everything. So, you know, these things definitely happen. And, uh, you know, hopefully the vendors you're using, you have a good contract with them. And, you know, you could even require that they have, you know, their own technology errors and emissions in their own cyber policy so that, you know, you guys have a, a mutual indemnity or like say, if something happens to me, you're going to pay me back. If something happens because of you, you're going to, you're going to pay me back. And there's an insurance policy behind that to, to back it up. So, you know, it comes down to risk management. It's, it's not something someone's, everybody's thinking about. Um, of course, uh, traditionally we've done this through like general liability policies when you hire people and everything, but now we're looking at it, you know, virtually as well. So that's what I would say about that. Excellent. Dave, I think, sir, you have a, uh, a follow-up on this. Yeah, and, and I didn't mean to uh, step in front of Wayne there, but uh, I, I just wanted to share and kind of ask everybody their thoughts on it. But I read an article that was shared on Reddit uh, actually yesterday where, uh, uh, and, and I know that the insurance companies will often install an agent that scans a network for vulnerabilities um, as part of its vetting process. Um, the article was sharing that all state insurance has announced that effective on September 27th, they're not gonna support any end client that uses uh, certain remote management tools uh, that MSPs use. Uh, and they listed a Datto, Ninja, and another one, and basically just said, if that MSP is using that device, um, uh, they're, they're no longer going to be covered. Switching that back over to the MSPs um, on really what the tools that they've been using. And Kaseya uh, was another one uh, that got blacklisted. We thought it was interesting that SolarWinds wasn't listed on it. But just wondering if you guys uh, have been experiencing or running into uh, uh, things like that on the back end. I, I can take the first swing at that. And I haven't seen the article with specific tools being called out, but I know that a lot of carriers are underwriting to RDA, RDP, because that is the easiest access point to get into these places. And so on, on the clients that we have quoted, if you happen to check, yes, we use that in a work from home environment, what company isn't using that technology or a version of it, uh, it really does trigger a lot more diligence. So I didn't know that, uh, that Allstate had done that, but I guess it makes perfect sense. They must have had breaches specific to each one of those tools. And, and again, if you're coming at them with, a, with an APT kind of an attack, you can, you can bust these things wide open. It, 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 with quantum, quantum computing and AI, boy, that's a pretty yeah. formidable set of tools, right? Yeah, and the thought was that either that scanner, either they know something that we don't, um, or that that scanner found probably like a default setting uh, that was just natively insecure. Um, that, that's what the presumption was. Because, and, and I'll bring up the article right after this and, and share it in the chat with everyone. Because um, uh, it was interesting because even the, the CISO uh, from Datto chimed in on the Reddit saying, hey, we found out about this in this Reddit article. Now I'm reaching out to Allstate. That's the worst place to find it is, is to read about it in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thanks. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that on to Wayne. 
No, I think everyone uh, everyone touched on it uh, pretty well. We don't uh, we don't have a lot of time left, to, so I would I would uh, put it back to uh, to Matt and uh, Gabe. Just that basically, you know, working with Gabe, all those questions that have to be answered that Cowbell's made it so easy now to get to get coverage in place. But there, those last few questions with smaller clients, where they only have a few employees and they're just just getting going. Um, they do look to us. Uh, so we then in turn look to Gabe <laughs> and say, Gabe, and that's when, we, that's when we pick up the phone and we just say, Gabe, this client needs this, this, this to be in place to answer those questions online so they can get covered. And they have a, they have a pretty, pretty deep bench of people to, to know. And Gabe, continue with you, sir. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, just kind of hearing what everyone said, I think it just really resonates in how much we all need to work together because there's a lot of there's a lot of ways where things can fall through, right? Um, just based on what's been going on. So if we're not, um, if the insured is not betting who they're working with, then there's a problem there. Um, if they have a trusted MSP that they're working with and they have a trusted agent who is reviewing those contracts and, and then, you know, in turn, the carrier their coverage too. So I think just seeing just talking about this example, kind of seeing how, how everything played out uh, and just really reviewing why all of us in tune working together is such a big part of it. But from the carrier standpoint, I mean, we don't particularly bet uh, which uh, providers they're working with. That's, that's, that's their, um, for us, that's at, uh, that's at their own initiative, um, at their own discretion who they want to work with. Gotcha. What, one of the things, and this is an observation, and again, uh, full rights and permissions to the panelists to club me upside the head in person. Um, in the audit world, we talk about things like the existence or occurrence from, a, from an assurance or a presentation layer. Do we have uh, the existence of backups or the existence of a firewall? What I see with a lot of the underwriting questions, and it varies, I'm seeing a lot more due diligence in my own organization where, where our customers are sending us standardized information gathering SIG questionnaires that are three or 400 questions long. Um, so when we look at something like a firewall, do you have a firewall? Yeah, you could have a firewall, but every rule set is set to any, and, and it's effectively just kind of there as, as a, a pass-through versus how well it's managed. Or do you have encryption, but we don't necessarily inquire into the nature and state around how keys are managed, how frequently they're rotated, uh, the strength of the key, things of that nature. And, and would love to get perspectives from the folks here on this is, is we run the challenge. We've got a class of, of companies or prospects, if you will, in this market that fundamentally don't have security programs, but they need one to be able to operate and get insurance for their business. And they don't know any of this stuff. And, and then our, our discovery questions, it's really speaking in two separate languages here. Um, so, so there's a bunch of uh, comments in there, and I apologize, but fundamentally, how do we get the due diligence to be a little bit more accurate around the state of the tools, not just the existence of the tools, one, and then what is the guidance for some of these smaller companies that are having to build kind of a de novo security program from scratch, two? <laughs> and I'll, uh, maybe, uh, Phil, I'll, I'll have you, and then uh, Joe and Gabe and, and Wayne will grab you as well. Right, so I'm going to go back to the, it used to be a SAS 70, now it's an SSA 16 or 18? 18. 18. 18. And, and you had the type one and the type two audit, right? The type yep. one was a snapshot. As of this date and this time, what I'm answering is correct. Now in a type two environment, it's a reassertion and a reattestation on a quarterly basis. Um, my, my experience is technology doesn't fail nearly as often as people fail. And, and that's the interesting thing about cyber insurance is that you, know, you can almost actually insure stupid. So, and I know that's a little pejorative, but you have a firewall, you forget to re-energize it. You don't update, you don't apply, you don't good patch management strategies. It, it's, it, it's a self-inflicted wound when the bad guy gets in. Cyber is there to protect you. So, did you have it in place at, at the time that you filled out the 300 question questionnaire? Yes. Did you not have it in place at the time of the event? Well, that's for the forensic people to figure out. And, and ultimately, yes, uh, I think the, the question was, 
civil penalties, the carrier reserves the right to actually pull back the policy, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, the old, if I would have known then what I know now, we never would have written this kind of thing. So the, the tools, I mean, you can throw a bunch of money at tools and technology and you can go out and buy all the latest and greatest things, but you can put a Barracuda network device or appliance in your rack and that's great, but if it's not configured right, you got a problem. If you're not doing patch management, if you're not managing end of life systems and end of support systems for your hardware, there's a million ways for the guys to get in. So Matt, your question was so long, I'm not sure I'm answering it completely, but uh, it, it, what did I miss? Yeah, no, I mean, I think what I've, what I, I guess more of a statement, what I see is that with some of the questionnaires, they're looking at the existence or occurrence of a firewall, and there's not a whole lot of analysis whether or not that firewall is managed, configured, policies and rules within the firewall are set up correctly. Um, and, and so I think what ends up happening is that the carrier has a false sense of security vis-a-vis uh, -vis what that company is doing versus what the actual reality might be in many cases. Can I, can I amend that from a false sense of security to an adverse reliance? Yeah. You said what we believed. And, and that ultimately is the kick in the wallet when the event happens. Exactly. And we have a garage door, but we never hung the back door on the house and it's wide open. And that's where things like cowbell scanners and, and, and more and more of these companies now are going to scanners and active scanners. And, um, you know, I, you have to understand that the carriers now are using the same technology or similar technology that the bad guys are using. So the we're too small doesn't hold water anymore because these are botnets that are out rattling every door and every window of every enterprise. So whether you're too small or too big, I mean, small towns are getting hit for eight and $10 million. They're looking for choke points. If I can stand on your oxygen hose, you're more likely to pay me quicker. So it, it, the worst thing you can do is say you have something when you don't, much like PCI self-auditing, right? You, you appoint, you fill out the questionnaire. Do you have, do yes, yes, yes. When in fact, you have none of it. Mm -hmm. And cyber has moved beyond that. Now, the best thing you can do is find somebody who knows the right people to figure out where the risk is for you and put your money towards those opportunities first. Because even the FBI has changed their position from if to when you get hit. And I think that's probably the most telling thing. And that's what's driving IT spending now within organizations. Suddenly the board is now starting to say, not just do we have DNO, but do we have some of that cyber stuff? It's showing up in mainstream TV. It's showing up exactly. on, on, in airline magazines. I mean, my goodness, everyone's talking about, so if you're a Scripps patient, you know, they you know about it. Joe, how about it? Joe, how about you? And then Gabe will hit you up as well. And I know we've got uh, just a few minutes left in our uh, discussion today. Great, great. What well, was the question again? <laughs> well, just, you know, like, you know, the nature, how, how detailed uh, the underwriting is, you know, so, so uh -huh. historically, I think the questions were frankly fairly superficial and they didn't get to the level of risk. But I think right. why don't I posit a, a, a separate type of question to you is, is, you know, we have a lot of companies that are relatively new trying to get their security programs up and running. Maybe some of the, you know, best practices or lessons learned that you guys can recommend that help them improve their overall security posture. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that, you know, it's when we're approaching a company, uh, our carrier, um, it's all about telling the story about the company, um, giving them the whole picture, who they are, uh, what they're doing, um, and the more things that we can show that they're doing uh, to uh, mitigate risk, the better. I think um, using a MSP, uh, a well-known one, uh, one where the MSP could even, uh, we could give a contact to the carrier and they could um, talk to, you know, the carrier even um, and tell them, you know, all the different things uh, we can write a narrative um, talking about all the different things that we're doing over and above um, what is required on the application. But yeah, I mean, new companies, you know, like what was it? Facebook is go fast and break things. Um, they're, they're trying to get sales and um, 
they're trying to get their product out there and ship it, right? So uh, maybe this is in the back of their mind, but um, if they want this uh, coverage, they're going to have to work with uh, someone like Dave's company and, uh, you know, use use their expertise or lean on their expertise uh, if they don't have anybody in-house um, in order to uh, either get this coverage and, or just be secure in general. Because, you know, as, as Phil was saying, um, the bad guys have AI, we have AI, um, they get, we have uh, patches, but they have new zero day stuff. I mean, uh, I heard about a WhatsApp, um, you don't even, where you can get a WhatsApp message and you don't even have to click on the, um, you don't even have to click on anything for them to infiltrate your device. So there's all sorts of um, new security risks out there. So you can't, like Phil is saying, you can't do everything, but you can, you know, have good risk management. Uh, so that's what I would say about that. Excellent. Gabe. Yeah, man, there's a lot of, lots of unwrap there what you, what you asked about. Um, so, <laughs> You know, I think obviously the insurance industry is changing quite a bit. And one thing I would say, so when you look at some of those legacy carriers out there, I think um, to your point, Matt, like the application process, like that seems like it's been pretty redundant. And even the renewal process and, you know, um, Phil and, and Joe and Wayne can probably test this more, just seeing what that renewal process is like with, with carriers where they're asking just a lot more detailed questions, but we're maybe not as relevant to when they first, you know, Start the business or start the application process. So, um, so we're in insure tech, and our process is obviously different. I think Phil is kind of um, alluding to, alluding to that. So we have a continuous underwriting process, um, really meaning that we're actually scanning the business. So um, if a if in a business does want to use or allows us to use their connector, so whatever uh, system cloud service they're uh, they're using, we work with the major ones, and then we do a soft scan, right? So we're actually checking the vulnerabilities. And uh, Matt, to your point, we we actually give them an overall. Um, assessment, right? So we're, we're giving them a, a cyber posture score, kind of the industry average versus uh, what they're actually ranking. So um, at that point, you know, it, it's a great opportunity for them to connect uh, with, with someone from like Days from, for example, to figure out, all right, now that we have these problems, what do we do? How do we fix it? Let's improve this and let's just have some overall risk management because we know the potential of a breach if the more vulnerabilities, obviously, the higher chance, higher probability for a claim. So how do we fix that? How do we address that? And then um, you know, going forward, just working with an MSP, I think just one that's qualified that, that is going to help you address those. And that too, we, we find that sometimes MSPs don't want to admit that there's vulnerabilities out there. Um, and so that's, that's just another opportunity where it's important to figure out what those vulnerabilities are and uh, having that scan um, is definitely a good indication to get started. Excellent. Wait, your insights. If I could add one thing to that, I think one of the greatest opportunities for the bad guys is the deniability of the IT suite, the CIO, the, the chief compliance officer, because when you take the output of one of Gabe's scans into the organization and you say, hey, your kids are not beautiful, <laughs> they get wildly defensive. And nobody has ugly kids, but there are a lot of them running around out there. So for those of us on the production side, we have to be very delicate in how we come back with that report and a lot of times you find just an orphan IP address that marketing set up and forgot to close down. Or when you find somebody who is open and, and really focused on making their business better, they see these kinds of reports, recognizing sometimes they do generate false positives. We get that. But they see these reports as kind of a, hey, you're trying to help me do my job better. Instead of getting defensive, let's be collaborative. Those are the people that get the best rates on their renewals. Those are the people that in the future may actually be able to get insurance because I foresee in the not too distant future where if you don't get an A grade, you don't buy insurance. And now you're basically insuring your organization with the balance sheet. And that's an ugly discussion to have with the board or the CFO or the investors. I'm going to hand the discussion over to my friend and colleague, Dave. I am uh... I, there's a handful of topics, obviously, to continue to address, but I will have to drop. But Dave, I will hand it over to you, sir. Cool, cool. Yeah, and thanks, um, yeah, thanks, thanks Matt. Matt. Bye bye. Great to see you. Um, Wayne, I'll hand that uh, same question over to you. And then, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's funny. We, I'm going to take sort of the other side of it, and I keep going back to these smaller companies, and uh, even in even in kind of Phil's world. 
tax preparers. We just did something uh, last year uh, as a real reach out to small tax preparers. And they didn't, a lot of them, so many don't understand that protecting taxpayer data, um, I mean, it's not only good business, but it, it's the law. <laughs> the IRS commissioner uh, put that in as part of the law. Uh, and a lot of these mom and pop um, uh, tax preparers have, have nothing in place. And so we've, we've actively been uh, reaching out to, to these folks because they're required to protect uh, our information. Their information. So yeah, all the big, uh, all the all the big companies, you know, have full IT departments, but these the small mom and pop shops um, need to get set up and need to, and need to take this uh, seriously. Yeah, they've got the same risk and a lot less of the same resources. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we are coming up on the hour. So um, I, w- what I wanted to ask is each of you, if you kind of be in the professionals that you are and everything that you've seen that's kind of taken us to where we are at this quote unquote snapshot in time, if you were to look into your crystal ball uh, and and share with everybody where you, it, it, it's two questions. One is where you kind of see things going and um, and then I'd like to circle back and wrap uh, up with asking each of you, uh, what's one piece of advice that you would share with everybody in the crowd based on what you know? And um, I'm just going to go from my left to right. So that would start with Phil. And then I'll come to you, Joe. All right. I, I, I don't want to miss. Those are two great questions. Where is this going? I don't see the patient getting healthier anytime sooner. Um, I think it's the old radar gun, radar detector. The bad guys are staying one step ahead. The poor CIOs, uh, chief security officers, they are they are in harm's way. Uh, you look at somebody like a Scripps or you look at somebody like a Kaseya or a Solar Winds. You look at the NSA, the, you know, who hasn't been breached. And these are people that have floors and floors of resources. So until they are successful in holding out the bad guys, I don't see how the SMB market stands a chance. So it, it's do the best you can with what you have. Um, I think the best advice is, is I like to break things down into actionable items. I think you have to, as a business person, you have to educate. I, I'm a strong believer in encryption and I'm an even stronger advocate of enforcement because one of the things we haven't talked about is do you have a, a solid security privacy policy? If you go to a company of any size at all and ask them what their security policy is, they're going to look at you with, with doe eyes. So you need to have, this needs to become part of the onboarding process. It needs to become part of the annual training and updates and whatever your industry is. And so if you can educate, if you can encrypt, if you lose encrypted data, it's nowhere near the penalty and enforce. And that's the enforcement then all of a sudden puts your C-suite in the bad guy police place. But boy, I'd much rather be seen as a jerk than seen in the unemployment line because somebody shut down my company. No, that's that's excellent. Um, um, Joe. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'll keep it short since we're um, kind of butting to the end of this. But I would say I would just kind of echo Phil and say, you know, you want to you want to make a plan uh, for cybersecurity. I mean, it's not enough to just buy a policy. Um, you need to have a plan. Uh, the C the C suite of the company needs to, to work on something on how they're going to um, implement, whether by hiring an MSP and doing an RFP. Um, in order to make sure that they are hitting all the things they need. Um, and then um, after they do that, oops, oh. uh, you need to educate. Uh, you need to educate uh, your employees and everybody in the organization. And um, then you need to test, right? Um, you can do stress tests. Um, you can hire a company to do an intrusion detection or, um, you know, white hat, white hat hack you uh, for more 
sophisticated um, organizations, uh, get the results, and then, you know, go back to the beginning, repeat, plan, educate, uh, test, and then uh, go back to the beginning. And maybe it's a quarterly thing or a monthly thing or a yearly thing, but it's something that, you know, every organization is going to need to kind of start doing um, if they aren't doing it already. And, you know, with the help of an MSP, uh, I think it's totally possible. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Wayne. Yeah, I think the just uh, the most important thing is the gatekeepers of the information at your company. Uh, if, if you take away anything, limit it to one, maybe two people, or limit the amount of information to the fewest number of people possible. And that one little thing uh, can protect so many people. Yeah. Uh, Gabe? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so yesterday I was uh, had the pleasure of listening to this FBI, our former FBI agent um, here, here in Arizona. And one of the stats he mentioned was that in 10 years, uh, he foresees cyber terrorism um, exceeding any kind of property uh, terrorism out there today. Uh, so to hear him kind of resonate that, uh, given the fact that 70% 70, 70 of Americans now work from home, um, <laughs> this industry is uh, in terms of cyber threats is only going to get bigger. I think I think that's pretty obvious to say. Um, and then in terms of my my advice, you know, to, just to reaffirm what what everyone said before, using MFA, using patching, uh, scanning, you know, checking those those phishing scans, using strong passwords, and having a, a contingency plan in place. I think all that is is really that just that simple blocking and tackling, and then obviously working with those trusted partners that we just talked about earlier. I would go a long way. Cool. That that's great advice. And um, uh, I, I was able to successfully keep us past the one o'clock hour. So I, I, I sincerely want to thank uh, each of you for uh, your time, your expertise, um, uh, uh, and uh, sharing your knowledge. Um, uh, I we it looks like we have touched on all the questions that uh, came in from the audience. So I, I think we're good, and I'll I'll let you guys go. Um, but thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, sharing everything that you have. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Yes. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.